Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. Today, we're hosting Rati and Alexander. They're about to give a talk based on their paper titled Block STM Scaling Blockchain Execution by Turning Ordering Curse to a Performance Blessing. Uh, Rati and Alexander are blockchain researchers and founding members of Aptos. And I'll let you take it from here. Thank you again for having me and thank you for the introduction and let me jump into it. <laughs> so we'll present today Block STM, a scaling blockchain execution for by turning all the encodes to a performance blessing. And um, this is how we can execute 160,000 transactions per second on the Aptos blockchain. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is a joint work with Vati Gelashvili, Julian Tiang, George Daenerys, Zikun Lee, Yu Hia, Un Tian Zhu, and Dalia Malki. So I think for this audience, I don't, I don't need to explain or motivate too much why scaling blockchain execution is one of the most important problems now. <laughs> but I, but I, I do want to say that roughly speaking, every blockchain uh, consists of uh, three main components, which is the first is the execution. Validators need to, need to agree on the order of the blocks. And we, we know that this, this, this problem was studied very a lot recently, and uh, there was a few recent developer developments such as Nilbi, MilBFT, and uh, and Novel and Task. We know that we can execute more than one hundred thousand transactions per second. However, the end-to-end -end, uh, blockchain latency will will be as good as the weakest component. And currently, there is nothing good for execution. So so this is what we try to tackle in this work. So in the execution layer, we have we have our validators. After they already agreed on the sequence of blocks, they need to take these blocks one by one, execute the transaction inside the blocks, and then apply the final state to, the, to their storage, to persi persi persist persisting the result of the transactions. So far, what we see in existing like blockchains, existing L1 from the engineering point of view, is uh, two approaches. One is to take just to execute everything sequentially. And this is, of course, not not scalable. Like uh, this, this will become very soon, if not already, a button like in any in any blockchain system. <laughs> the, the other approach is to try to use parallelism. However, um, most of the time, this they require users to specify and give some extra information along alongside with the transactions, such as declare the dependencies or give some hints of uh, what are the right sets. So uh, of course, this is not first. This is not uh, ergo, er, ergonomic for the users, for the users' point of view. But also, it is very, it's, it's also very limiting and not not the best, not not the best experience. This brings me to our goal in this work, which is to design a parallel execution engine that, from the one hand, will be transparent to the users. From the users' point of view, um, the users shouldn't. The users, the users might think that everything underneath is executed sequentially. It doesn't need to do anything. But but on the other hand, we do want an engine that will be adaptive to the workload, which means that if the if the workload is highly parallelizable, meaning that there are very very little very very few conflicts in the workload, then we can extract the extract the inherent parallelism and achieve very high throughput. But not less importantly, if we get a workload that is very sequential, meaning that there are a lot of conflicts between the transactions, then we want to introduce as little overhead synchronization overhead as possible um, compared to, the, to, to a real sequential execution of the workload. OK, and of course, there is some prior work on a uh, academic prior work on how to solve this problem. <laughs> So the first approach that I want to present is called the, the, min, the, the minor replay, which was interview, introduced a few years ago. So in this approach, we have the minor. Um, it, ca it can be a minor and permissionless settings. It can be a leader and permission settings. doesn't matter. But the idea, but the idea is there is one, one entity it, it, that, which executes the transaction first. And it can do it like sequentially. It can do it with some black box other solution. And then after executing, it can ex ex after executing it, it can extract the dependency DAG, the, the the graph of all dependencies on the in the transaction between the transactions. And then it can send this DAG to the other validators. Now they in turn can use this DAG in order to in order to uh, come up with a perfect fault, uh, fault join schedule, which will extract the perfect parallelism. This approach has some, some limitation. First is that maybe the validators, they can execute very fast, but what about the miner? The miner is still slow. We need to go and execute the transaction first. <laughs> and the overall latency is high. 
And, and not less importantly, there is an issue of trust. Why would if, if the miner is Byzantine, why why would why would validators trust him? And the next approach is BOM, which is actually from the from the database context, um, in which in which they propose to execute to execute transaction according to a fixed preset order, meaning that they a priori agree on the order of transactions and a priori agree so, so so the execution the final execute the final state of the of the execution should be equivalent to go and execute this transaction according to this predefined agreed fixed order if they can and and in this in this work they assume that they 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 know all the all the all the all the estimations of the of the of the right locations so by for example by some static analysis on pre execution and if if they know if they know everything if they know where each transaction is going to write what they do and they they prepare they statically prepare data structures before the execution for every possible memory location and they prepare a slot for every for every transaction that is estimated to is estimated to write there so when a trans when another transaction wants to read from this memory location, it knows exactly what slot it should look for. So if if for example in this example the the the, the value seven is already there, so the transaction can continue. However, in this example, the value is not is not yet there, but it's estimated to be there, so the transaction should wait. Other, otherwise, otherwise, yeah, other, uh, it, it just have to wait. This approach required requires perfect. Or maybe over at least perfect over, over overestimation of the rights, and I'm not sure it's very realistic in the blockchain settings because because we we want to support arbitrary smart contracts and many times we don't even know in advance where we are going to write. If we have an unestimated right, then the best then the best bomb can do is just to update their estimations and uh, restart from scratch. Another prior work, which is huge prior work, which is called software and transactional memory, was introduced first time, I think, 30 years ago and studied a lot since then. And, and the idea is there is to come up with a, with a framework to, to atomically, atomically execute arbitrary, of transa uh, arbitrary transactions. So from the user experience point of view, this is very good. A user, what, a user, what the user needs to do in if, if you use a software and transactional memory library is to specify a begin, the transaction begin, then you can write an arbitrary code, specify transaction end, and the library makes sense, may make sure that all its all the code between the begin transaction and transaction is executed atomically. So so the so the user doesn't know to do that does not doesn't need to do anything. With optimistic concurrency control, what's happening is that we have the pool of transaction, they are statically mapped to threads. So a thread takes a transaction, he executes it. He then during the execution, he keeps tracks of read set and write set. Then, in, then, then after the execution, he needs to revalidate the reads to make sure that, that nothing changed. So all the decision he makes during the transaction is still valid. And then if, if, validation, if validation succeeds, then he can commit. Otherwise, I need to. Otherwise, I need to retry execution. <laughs> so this this approach seems like seems very good and it seems like it can be a good fit for blockchains. However, there are, however there are a few problems. So first, in practice, even though there are like thirty thousands of papers, academic papers on software transactional memory, in practice they are very rarely deployed. And this is before. This is because usually their performance is very limited. Uh, compared to to to, to other to other fine grained solution, and this is this is because like keeping track of the the bookkeeping and the synchronization overhead is usually high. <laughs> In addition, gen generally the outcome of STMs is not deterministic. So if we have two my two two validators that execute the same block, it's possible that they will come up with with different with different final states because because they are because they are executing the transaction in different order. So deterministic and, and preset order STMs do exist. However, they treat they treat it as a cause. They treat it as an additional um, limitation limitation on constraint on the system, and as a result, their performance is is, is even worse. <laughs> um, however, the, the good news about STMs is that we know that uh, they can be very, very efficient if they are, if they are applied for a specific purpose, for a specific use case.
In the next few slides, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you that blockchain is actually a, a specific use case that might be good for, for STMs. So first is the block granularity. And what I mean by that is that in, 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 in general purpose STM, we need to commit transactions in the individually, like each transaction one by one. However, in the blockchain, in the, for, the, for blockchains, it doesn't matter. We, we can just commit the entire block together. So this can save a lot of synchronization overhead in, 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 in tracking the individual commit. When can we commit a transaction? We, we, just, we can just commit the entire block. And another, another win from the block granularity is, the, is that garbage collection comes for free. Usually, usually STMs pay a lot in synchronization in order to know when they can reclaim memory and things like this. And here we can just do it trivially in between, in between block executions. Another use case of the blockchain uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the safety of the VM. So usually, again, in STMs, um, when, we, when we use STMs optimistically, optimistically execute transactions, meaning that some of the transaction can, transactions can read values that, that are just wrong values. And in order to make sure that the program is not, does, not, does, not, does not come to some inconsistent state, um, STMs usually, usually pay a lot in synchronization overhead to satisfy a property called opacity. Meaning that in every in every read, every read that the transaction does, every state that the transaction does is is is, is legal. So here, here is one example. Suppose that we have a problem with the following invariant in which x is always greater than y. And if you see in the in, as you see in this example, if, if the transaction here are executed sequentially, that this is variant always hold. However, let's see the following concurrent execution. So so the green thread comes. And, and write x equal two. Then the, the blue thread go, the blue thread goes and read x. Later the, the purple thread goes, write x equal three, but it doesn't matter because the green the, the, the blue thread already already read x equal two. And then the, the purple thread goes and write y equal two, y equal two. Next, the blue thread will go, read y, read y, and accidentally divide divide by zero. Which might which might crash the crash the entire program. However, because in the blockchain in the blockchain use case we already have a VM that has to guarantee and protect against any any arbitrary smart contracts bugs, then we, we don't we don't need to care about we don't need to care about this issue. This is already provided by, by provided by us provided for us by the VM. So we can save a lot in synchronization overhead. Not worry about it. The two first observations were, I think it's very intuitively intuitive how they can improve our performance and save on synchronization over it. Now, the third observation is, is at least to me, was a, it was completely counterintuitive. So, and the observation is that, that preset order, predefining the order of transaction can be a performance blessing. And what I mean by predefining the order of transaction is that the final state of the execution is equivalent to going and execute the transaction one by one in some predefined order. This is what I mean. And to be fair, this observation, as I already mentioned earlier, was already done by Bohm in the context of databases. But we believe that in this work, we take this observation into the extreme and use it in many, 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 many places. Here's some intuition of why, why this might be helpful. So, so consider, consider two transaction X and Y. And if we don't have a preset order, then we don't know, which, we don't know a priori which transaction should go first. So, so if the purple thread goes first, then X is serialized before Y. However, if the green, if the green thread goes first, then Y is serialized before X. And otherwise, if if we if they if they if they if, if they both go concurrently, then it depends. And inherently, they need to solve some consensus-like synchronization tasks tasks in order to determine who goes first. And this is a lot of synchronization overhead, at least intuitively. And when when we when we predefine the order, we don't need to solve this task. We just need to make sure that that everybody knows the order and follow it. Now, now I think I, I want to I wanna talk about, I want to start talking about block STM. And first, I want to describe the, the, the system components. <laughs> so we have the VM, and we treat it as a black box. We give it a transaction, a single transaction, it executes it. Similar to BOM, we are going to use multi-version data structures in order to avoid write-write conflicts. <laughs> but differently from BOM, we are not going we, we are not assuming that we know the estimation. So we are not building this multi-version data structure statically at the beginning. <laughs> Instead, we are going to learn the estimations on the flight 
on the fly, and we are going to build this multi-version data structure dynamically. Now, another difference from, from general purpose STM is, is that we don't statically map transactions to the executor, the executor executing threads. And so, so in, what, what instead we have, we have some collaborative scheduler to which thread goes to get their next, next, trans, next, next transaction, either to execute or to validate. And we have the executor, which is basically the main loop, which control all the logic of the thread. So, so here is roughly how it works. <laughs> A thread goes to the collaborative scheduler to ask to the to the to, to get the next task to to to, to ne the, the next the next task to perform. If if it is an execution task, then the thread goes to VM and asks the VM to execute the transaction. The VM in turn will go to the multi-version data structure in order to read. <laughs> Then after the after the VM finishes the execution, the VM doesn't write back to the multiversion data structure. Instead, it returns a read and write set to the executor so that the executor can, can track it for future validation. And then the executor, and then the thread goes and applies the write to the multiversion multi -version data structure. Now, if the tax, if 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 the if the thread gets a validation tax uh, tax uh, task, sorry, from, from the collaborative scheduler, then it needs to go and revalidate the reads. All the reads it has in, in its read set, it needs to go and revalidate. Anyway, in both cases, uh, execution and validation, the thread goes back to the collaborative schedule and update it according to the result. Um, on the so the collaborative the collaborative scheduler knows what are the next uh, transaction that needs execution and revalidation. So now a few words about the multi-version data structure that we are using. Yeah, the multi-version, the data structure itself is not is not novel. We're using a standard stand is not uh, not novel. We're using a standard uh, multi-version data structure for every every location in order to avoid write write conflicts. <laughs> so what we do is that whenever a transaction wants to add, to to write and write a value, it just goes and uh, it just goes and adds a new slot to the to the data structure. For this example, in this example, transaction number six. Now, when a transaction wants to read a value, let's say transaction number five here, it goes in the multiversion data structure and find the, the, the index, define the value written by the trans, the, the highest transaction transaction that is lower, lower than lower than the transaction. In this case, transaction five reads the value written by transaction three. Now let's talk about the collaborative schedule, which is the, which is where the most of the most of the logic of our uh, block STM is. We need we need a logic to find the next the next task, and abstractly you can think of it as a, as a global global queue of tasks which like, which uh, threads goes and and pick from. But also remember that we need to respect the preset order, right? We need to execute the transaction according to, to the, the preset order. So, so the collaborative schedule needs to make sure that we prioritize execution and validation tasks for lower transactions. In addition, um, validation must, must, must logically occur in a sequence, and I explain it in a second. So, so, so here is an example. Here is our preset order, right? So first, for first, First, we go and execute, let's say, concurrently, optimistically, concurrently, transaction one, two, and three. Then we need to, uh, need to validate it also optimistically, concurrently. We go and validate transaction one, two, and three. Then assume that transaction one and three, they, are, they were good, and validation succeed, but, but transaction two are both. OK, so transaction two has to be re-executed. And now, importantly, after transaction two is re executed, because we need to because we need to go according to the preset order, it, transaction three need to be revalidated again and possibly again re possibly maybe maybe also re executed. The collaborative scheduler optimistically dispatch both execution and validation tasks, and and we know that successful validation doesn't mean doesn't doesn't mean safe to commit. However, fail validation, fail validation means, means need to re-execute. So the collaborative scheduler uh, needs to keep, 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 uh, keep dispatching this validation and uh, execution tasks and somehow eventually decide that, uh, OK, no more tasks, we can commit the entire block. Another purpose of the collaborative scheduler is also manage the dependencies. So and 
where, as I, as I said before, like similarly to Bohm, we leverage the preset order in order to in order to reduce the abort rate. And the way we do it is that if transaction X tries reading a location that transaction Y is estimated to read to read from, and we know that X depends on Y according to the preset order, then then we need to suspend X and add the, and add X to the Y dependency. Meaning that when, whenever whenever y is finally executed, then we can unsuspend x and block x and let it continue the execution. Okay, so before before I told you that we don't we did not assume anything about the the estimation, right? We we so so how exactly we compute them on the fly? Remember our uh, multiversion data structure library? Uh, that sorry, multiversion data structure. We are going to use the aborts to estimate the rights and use the multiversion data structure to track them. So here is an example. Let's say let's say transaction three executes, writes its value to the to the data structure, and then at some point fails validation. So what it goes and it, the transaction needs to go to all the places it touched and all the values it, it wrote before. It goes and instead of just deleting them, it's going to mark them as estimation. So, so later, if a transaction later comes, again, transaction number five comes, the value the transaction number five needs to read is the value written by transaction three, because it always looks for the, the highest transaction wrote to this location, which is lower than, than five. And then five comes and see that the, the value is not there. However, however, there is an estimation mark there, which means that transaction three is, is currently re-executing and, and it's luckily to write here again. So it's better for transaction five to just wait because otherwise it will execute and do some do, just do wasted work because probably it will need to fail validation and we will need to be re-executed. And this is how we can also have cascades of aborts. So if you want to compare our approach of right estimation to, for example, from pre, to pre-execution, right? We, we could we could try and learn the estimation by static analysis by, by by just go and uh, execute the transactions just from the from the initial stage as go and execute the transaction just to see where they're gonna write right so in the good case when when we execute so first thing we execute we never we never do pre-execution so we just execute so if if we are lucky and we can commit the transaction with with without ever executing it then we are not wasting any work right and the bad case when we when we do need to execute and we aborted the first execution then at least the estimation that we have is like is, is much fresher we have them, we have them for a fresher state and if it, compared to the to the right estimate the, the assumption or in bomb that right, right, right estimation are given <laughs> So in block STM, this is just an optimization. The protocol will work fine even, with, even if we will not, even will not estimate rights at all. The collaborative scheduler is really like the, where the main logic is for block STM. <laughs> and the key for our performance is to implement the logic is as efficiently as possible. And we need a way to pick tasks with the lower transaction index. And if we, if we just use order set or priority queue, which are available in uh, like in the standard libraries, um, then even if we even if this 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 older set have relaxed semantics, we know we know then in January they cannot scale because the queues they they have too much contention. So we once again leverage the preset older, and we and and by and by and by using it we we are able to implement a counting based very efficient concurrent older set. I'm, I'm going to give you now the high level intuition. So in, in order to do it, we have a vector, we have an array. Each slot in the array represents uh, each transaction, uh, is correspond to each transaction and, and represent whether the transaction needs to be revalidated or executed. And we also keep one index, uh, which is atomic variable, which is a lower bound on a slot in which a transaction needs to be revalidated or executed. Okay, so in order to pick a task, a thread comes and just perform a fetch and add on the index. If the value that it can, then it takes the value back, goes and reads the, the, the appropriate slot and see what is there. If it's empty, then there's nothing to do with to this transaction. Okay, so it goes and fetch and add again the index. And in this example, it, so it says that there is a transaction to validate and it go and takes the task and go and validate it. 
Now later, if we want to add validation or execution tasks to the to this older set, all we need to do is just to mark it, just to mark it in the in the in the appropriate slots and pull back the index. Now, in order to keep track of the of this, what transaction need to be validated, what transaction need to be executed, right? This like this this array, we, it's a bit more complicated. We have like we have a, the transaction have, have a life cycle of states, which is which is go which is which is which is which is go through. So first, it's ready to execute. Then ready to execute means that, as as it says, it's it's need to be re-executed. Then it then and and executed means that it's ready to be revalidated. Now the reason we need also executing and aborting in between is because we need to the, we need to make sure that at least one transaction, at least one thread concurrently execute a transaction and at least one thread concurrently aborting a transaction. So this is why we have it to solve to solve the races. We, we, we want only one execution and one aborting concurrently, right? At most once. At, that's at least then at most together, it has to be done. In our implementation, we actually compare the um, log-free and the mutex-based implementation of it, and 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 we saw that the mute and we can we can we can we can use mutexes without harm the performance. And this is also this is what we do eventually for the code to be more readable. And uh, this is because we, the mechanism, the fetch and increment mechanism, is a, is actually provide a very good load balancing on on these slots. A few other things that I want to mention here is that the collaborative scheduler also need, also need to make uh, also need to handle the races between the adding dependencies and taking the dependencies, and uh, also when we decide that when we see a dependency, there there are a few strategies that we can take, and one is that just to crash and we execute later. The other one is that when we see a dependency, we just wait for a signal to continue, and we experiment with both of, with both of them, and there are some trade-offs in performance. Of course, what I explained to you so far is a very like high-level intuition and uh, like a lot more details in the paper. But I just want to touch very briefly some of the algorithmic optimization to give you some idea. <laughs> so first we have we have these two older we have not one older set we have two older set one is for execution and one of the, and one is for validation. <laughs> and uh, one thing that we want to do is that we want to validate as soon as possible. So this will help us to avoid cascades of aborts because the sooner we realize that the, 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 the transaction needs to be revalidated, it also means that all the values it loads are bad and we don't want other transactions to read these values and continue executing. We want, we want everything to just see dependencies and stop when we need to execute things. So, so in order to do it, we, um, whenever we see an abort, we already schedule a higher transaction for, valid for validation. When we finish the executions, sometimes we need to schedule this validation again. However, we have an optimization here, and if this execution doesn't write to, a, to any new location, meaning that everything it wrote before, uh, everything it wrote now, it also wrote before, so everything was already estimated in the data structures, then we don't need to revalidate again. And also, we are trying to reduce the index as little as possible. So sometimes we, we, we just pass the task around. An execution, execution finishes, and instead of pulling back the validation index, if it needs to revalidate stuff, it just picks the task and starts validating it. At the beginning, I told you that one of the things that uh, make us uh, improve performance is that we can lazily commit the entire block together. Right, we don't track individual commits, and this is how we do it. So during the 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 collaborative scheduler also needs to keep track of all ongoing execution and validation tasks. Whenever a thread observes that there is no ongoing execution task, and simultaneously there are, there are no there are no more tasks in the queues, meaning that both indexes are are, are equal to the number of transactions, right? Then then we can then we can just then, then, then it means that all the transactional can be can be can be safely committed. And in order to be able to simultaneously verify that these two um, these two this the, the these two property holds, we we implement a double the double collect technique. As for correctness in the paper, we have a very long and formal proof of both safety, safety and liveness. We basically show that the final state is equivalent to a sequential one of all transactions. And for liveness, we prove that there is no deadlock or, or live lock. If threads keep taking steps, then, then they all will terminate. What we show is this, to, both two conditions, we saw that if a thread um, 
simultaneously see these both two conditions, then, then it's safe to commit. And, we, and for Linus, we prove that eventually one thread will see these conditions and notify the others. OK, now let's talk about the fun stuff. <laughs> so we implemented block STM in Rust uh, in both DM and Aptos and, and, uh, and merged it to the, <coughs> to, the, to the main benches. And from comparison, we also implemented on the DM code base BOM. And, and lithium. So for BOM, because BOM needs perfect estimation, we give BOM perfect estimation and we don't measure this time. And lithium is a recent deterministic STM algorithm. For experiments, we use peer-to-peer -peer transactions, both the standard transaction provided by DM and Aptos. <laughs> we, use, we use two block sizes, 1K and 10K. And we, we, we experiments with, with two, 10, 1,000, and 10,000 number of accounts. Note no, that the number of accounts correspond to the contention level. The more accounts we have, the, the less conflicts we have, and the, the, the workload is more paralyzable. In these plots, we can, see the, the, we can see the results on the DM blockchain with standard peer to peer transaction, which consist of, they are not trivial, they consist of 24, 21 reads and four writes. <laughs> And here is important to see the comparison to BOM. <laughs> so, when the so when the transaction, when the block size is 1K, we're actually better than BOM. Uh, even though we give the BOM uh, estimation for free and we don't charge any time from, for this, no penalties. We just execute, we just measure how much time it takes BOM to execute with these for free estimations. <laughs> So we see that our, our uh, block STM is slightly out of perform BOM when the block size is 1K. And this is because um, block, uh, BOM needs to recompute the static data structures and it takes time before, before BOM starts executing. And when we increase the block size to 10K, we actually see that BOM outperforms slightly block STM. And this is because the, the time it takes to pre-compute the, the static data structure are now amortized because the block size is bigger. So on this plot, I want to I want to show you uh, the comparison between uh, between block STM uh, and the sequential execution with different contention level. <laughs> this was done on the Aptos block, uh, blockchain with again peer to peer transactions uh, again non trivial eight reads and five writes. <laughs> so we see that the blue line we see that when the contention is low, ten thousand accounts, then we can achieve more than one sixty thousand transactions per second. When the, when the contention is high, um, 100 account, we still get very good numbers. We achieve over uh, more than 80,000 transactions per second. Now, not less importantly, when we have two accounts, two accounts basically mean that, that all the transactions have conflict among them. And the best we can do is just execute them sequentially. If you compare the red line to the black line, the black line is just a sequential execution of the transactions. So then you can see that the, the block the block STM overhead is very little, which is which is exactly the goal, right? What we wanted to achieve. We wanted the, we wanted our um, our engine, our parallel engine, to be able to dynamically extract the parallelism of every workload and and to adapt, right? Just to conclude, uh, and there are a few possible extension to this work. First, we can consider now nested transaction in order to, nested transactions in order to deal with popular contracts. We can also try and combine block STM with the minor replay uh, approach that I presented in the beginning. Let the miner um, run the, the, the block using block STM, extract the dependency graph, and then send it to the other miners. We also didn't optimize um, our implementation to NUMA or hyperthreading. So this is also some, something that we can do if we want to push the performance further. And, and in general, I want to say that if, if you think about blockchain performance, so, so currently we already know that we can speed up the blockchain, the, the execution. We have like a, a few, few recent papers shows how to, system shows how to do it and how to achieve over than 100 transactions per second. We have, uh, right, we have, yeah, at, at least a few, and uh, and the next, if we want to, but however, if we want the end to end, -to -end uh, perform performance of over one hundred transactions per second, then we still need to improve the storage. We have the consensus now. We have the execution storage is the last uh, is the last is the last is the last thing we need to improve. <laughs> 
Now, now, if we now, now, I probably will be able to do it, and in a, in a less in, in a very short time, we will have a blockchain that will end to end run uh, over one hundred transactions per second, one hundred thousand transactions per second. However, if you think further to the future, like a few years ago, a few years from now, um, then and we're talking about like millions of transactions per second. Then I think the best we, we will we will need to find a very good way to shard the blockchain and. This, this is not an easy problem, and I hope as like as a research community, I hope that we will be able to come up with some cool ideas and good solutions. Okay, I think I almost done with my talk. I just want to mention that uh, we are we are we in Aptos. We are now building a lab. We are hiring people, but more importantly, we are looking forward to for, like and looking for collaborations. So if yeah, feel free. We can. We are really we are really open to collaboration on this project and other projects. Thank you for having me.